Hi, everyone. This is Matt Britton, CEO of Suzy. I am here uh, with my friend Piers Fox, uh, Editor-in-Chief of PSFK. Piers, thanks for joining us again. Yeah, it's great to be here. Can't wait to uh, go through this piece of research uh, and share some of these ideas. Absolutely. Um, today, we are here to talk about really a very hot topic in the news today amongst really companies of all sizes, which is the future of work. Uh, there's been so much discussion about the consumer and how they're changing their shopping and buying habits, but perhaps even a bigger trend that will come out of this crisis, um, if and when it ever ends, is how people will change their work habits. And more specifically, will they still be going into offices and do, will companies mandate it? And how will it impact things like collaboration and productivity in the workforce across companies of all industries? So that's what we are here to talk about today. Um, and you know we have partnered with PSFK because they have long been known as really a, a leader in terms of identifying consumer trends. And uh, we're really happy to be partnering with you guys, Piers, on, on this uh, study that we're gonna be talking about today. Yeah, that's great. I can't wait um, to um, go through some of these ideas. For those of you who don't know what Suzy is, we are a real-time market research platform, a software platform that companies of all sizes can tap into to really put their finger on the pulse of the consumer. Uh, we've been quite busy over the last four months uh, as this crisis has unfolded and developed as companies really across every industry need to figure out and continue to figure out how these changes are impacting the way that consumers behave and their perception of brands and how they buy, et cetera. And we've continued to uncover new insights that our clients and partners have really gotten a lot of value out of. And I just want to thank everyone who's been kind of with us since the beginning for joining again today. And hopefully uh, we'll continue to add value uh, throughout this webinar. Piers, you want to talk a little, a little bit about PSFK? Sure. Um, you know, at PSFK, we are a, um, trends research company and you know what we do is we look at weak signals and identify bigger themes and we um and from those themes we create frameworks for which you know our partners like Susie can then go away and investigate what's happening in a certain topic the topic today being work but we can talk about retail we can talk about healthcare um so um and that's what we do as a business kind of look identifying trends and try to and what the opportunities are around them Perfect. And today we are going to be identifying trends that are born out of a study. Uh, we conducted two studies for the research that we're going to be uh, reviewing with everybody today. The first study was conducted from June 8th to 9th with a sample size of 1,000 specifically work from home participants, people who have uh, let us know that currently they are working from home. And the second study was conducted from June 8th to 11th with a sample size of 360 IT decision makers. These are people that are part of larger enterprises that are in charge of making uh, decisions in the information technology realm. Uh, both studies um, have samples that are directionally representative of US consumers working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. Uh, so let's dive in um, and talk about reimagining the modern workplace. So as most of you know, the COVID-19 crisis didn't start to work from home trend, but it certainly has accelerated it and will continue to accelerate for a very long time. Uh, one stat that, or one fact that often gets, I think, easily forgotten about by the media and many who I speak to is that work from home is actually a privilege that really is available only to a select few. It's to largely employees that are in the information or creative industries. Uh, many of, of consumers across America actually don't even have access to broadband internet. And other, other people work in industries where working from home isn't an option. So as we go through this, it's really important to keep in mind that work from home is really a luxury right now. Um, and those who are able to work from home obviously should never forget that. But the question is, will that continue? And will this massive work from mm -hmm. home trend continue into this? So when we talk about the work from home workforce, we're typically referring to knowledge workers, people whose jobs involve uh, handling or using information. Because obviously if they're handling inf uh, information, it's something that they can do virtually. They can use modern technology to be able to do. And we're talking about people in professional services, management, finance, real estate, um, even some financial um, services, um, new, new age financial services industries are able to really work from home while well, again, other industries, uh, not so much. Right now, there's about 37% of all US jobs that are able to be worked from a work uh, remote environment. So again, these are people who don't need to go into a physical office to be able to adequately complete their jobs. And those are the industries really being disrupted in terms of uh, the future of the office. 
So a lot of us has gotten quite comfortable uh, working from home. You know, obviously it does not come without challenges, especially to parents who have to manage children while they're, uh, you know, balancing a very intense uh, work day. But that being said, 98% of people would like to continue to work remotely for at least some of the time for the rest of their career. Uh, that's a massive number. These are people that have gotten a taste for the first time of what it's like to not have to commute, to be able to conduct work from the comfort of their home office or living room. And they've come out in force and have basically said, listen, we want our companies to rethink about the way they look at our office environment because working from home has been so very productive. Uh, for us. And in that regard, one in five CFOs say they plan to keep at least 20% of the workforce remotely to cut costs. Because you have to remember, this is not just a cultural issue, but it's a financial issue. If you look at the balance sheet or PL of so many large companies, their facility costs ranks very high up there in terms of um, where companies have their expenditures. And CFOs have taken this opportunity to look at their balance sheet, look at their line items and say, well, maybe we can reduce these costs. So uh, not only do employees like it, but obviously CFOs like it because it does uh, provide such a beneficial cost saver. So Jeff Staley, uh, Jeff Staley from C the CEO of Barclays said, the notion of putting 7,000 people in a building may be a thing of the past. And you know, this is Barclays, a huge financial services company. We are really starting to see this now uh, be a shared sentiment across larger enterprises. Um, very early on, you saw a lot of smaller companies in technology um, and even you know leaders in technology like Twitter start to say, you know, we're going to give employees the ability to work remotely. But now you see more legacy companies, legacy industries like financial services and Barclays coming out and saying, we don't know if we're going to put 7,000 people in an office anymore. We don't know if it's needed. We don't know if it's going to be safe. And our employees are shouting loud and clear that they are being productive from a work environment. Yeah, that was a great set of stats. Um, I was reading this morning um, an article that just came out in the New York Times that actually looks at the history of work from home and uh, there's, there's actually quite a long history of work from home and how different companies from Best Buy to Yahoo have tried it and had to go through different steps. But as you said, Matt, um, we're living in special times where everything's being accelerated. We see this accelerated change. And so um, we, the, both the workers and the kind of the companies are being forced to, to rethink how this situation might work both in the short term and long term so it's a really interesting space when we um we started working with you we kind of shared this kind of set of trends that we identified and these are really trends which we think are going to shape the the modern workplace and um and for the rest of the presentation what we're going to do is um basically talk use this as a bit of a framework for the conversation help the kind of audience uh, see insights, gather insights, and uh, identify new ideas and opportunities. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we discussed um, eight trends really shaping the modern workforce, mm -hmm. five of which we're going to be covering during today's webinar. Three others um, are going to be covered in the full SUSE PSFK report that's going to be shared after the webinar. But the five that we're going to be covering today is really, first of all, the shift from video to virtual. Second, we're going to be talking about real-time collaboration tools. Third, the notion of assisted workflow. How is technology really enabling workflow and collaboration across the enterprise? Uh, what does a remote culture look like? And what are some home office perks uh, that employees want and expect from their employees? That's great. So, so this first thing that we're going to talk about is this idea of the shift from video to virtual. I think we've we'll all become pretty familiar with the video call, the conference call, the Zoom meeting. Um, but as we all know, we miss a little bit of kind of that interpersonal engagement, that sort of intuition that we all get when we're kind of responding to one another, the nonverbal cues. And so what we're seeing is um, platforms, services, technologies being developed that allow um, co-workers to come together and um, uh, work with each other, collaborate with each other, and basically present from, to with each other. And so you can present better and understand each other better as well. Oops. So an overwhelming majority of people are currently participating in virtual activities uh, in terms of work from the work from home audience. Nearly 80 percent are participating in video conferencing, 70 percent chatting online, uh, over half are screen sharing. So these are tools that really readily got adopted, um, adapt, adopted quickly as the COVID crisis started to spread. 
And it's interesting to me because FaceTime and Skype and these tools have been around for so long, but it was never really intuitive or commonplace if you were on a business call to set up a video conference call. Even if you were talking to somebody across the country, we just did conference calls. And it's not like the technology didn't exist. Um, and now all of a sudden it is kind of commonplace and it's not taboo anymore to suggest to a client that you're going to see their face during your call. So that's a real cultural shift that's happened. And it's interesting that it took a crisis like this to kind of enforce that. You know what I mean, Pierce? Because like I would never, if I was calling you for business, just FaceTime you during it, we would just mm -hmm. do a phone call. So I just think that's super interesting. Yeah, it's interesting kind of also kind of where, where that's going to peak in some ways where which calls we take audio and which tech calls we're going to take video. I'm sure that that will begin to work itself out. Um, right. And there's also that weird situation where like you'll be on a call and your video will be on and theirs aren't, are and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. They're, on a hike. they're on a hike somewhere in the hills. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, or in their underwear at home. Um, so people are using a variety of different tools to enable their virtual communications. Uh, Zoom is a company that really exploded at the beginning of this crisis, ran into some headwinds very early on because of their lack of security protocols. And many companies and um, organizations like the Department of Education in New York City started to actually ban the use of Zoom because they worried about the wrong people joining the calls. But that being said, they've really um, used this as an opportunity for dramatic growth. Uh, you have tools like WhatsApp that's owned by Facebook that have also been readily adopted, especially for international communications. And Microsoft has really stepped on the gas with their Teams product um, as they continue to really dominate the enterprise in terms of um, information technology to really be able to expand a new product called Teams, which is essentially a Zoom competitor. Um, still, work from homers are really struggling to socialize virtually, um, and that really uh, increases with age. So uh, two thirds of um, work from homers age 60 to 72 agree with the fact that they're struggling to, to socialize virtually with other people, uh, much less so with younger consumers. But overall, I think that the work environment has been so largely collaborative and such a big part of somebody's social identity that really having the rug pulled out beneath people has been a struggle uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, it's not all roses as a, as it relates to consumers working from home, despite the fact that they are saying it's, it's something that they actually want to continue. Um, nearly over 40% of work from homers have missed those water cooler moments. And it's really in that serendipity that I believe so much innovation in business happens. Um, if you think about, you know, a platform like Zoom, you have to be quite intentional. You know, when you are wanting to speak to somebody, you schedule time and you're only speaking to the person you schedule time with um, versus an office environment where you're going to run into somebody um, unexpectedly or share an elevator with them or or enter a meeting earlier than the last one ended and just have these sidebar conversations where so much great ideas and innovation happen. And I think that's really one thing that, uh, you know, many people I think underestimate when they jump to say we should just be working remotely forever is is that serendipity and i think you know there's it's definitely a big opportunity for platforms as well to be able to sort of influence that so one of the questions we have is can technology really uh recreate the water cooler peers any thoughts on that yeah you know um we were doing some research you know as we were thinking about all of this and one of the concepts we see coming out of this design firm called Argo Design is this idea of the square. And what you have here is, they describe it as a window. It's really you pull it down when you start your day. And really, it's a screen that's projected on by four different cameras. And um, it allows you, in some ways, to sit beside your colleagues. And you were talking about serendipity, Matt. You know, what it allows you to do is not, you know, with most Zoom calls, we have to, like, face each other either listen or we got to participate and here there's a little, a little more of just sitting back working and then you can turn and talk to your colleague and your colleague sees the the mirror image and so there's better collaboration of course you can engage each other's directly but um uh it provides that serendipity and there's kind of cues um Very i like cool. it. I also know some execs have you know they, they'll have quote-unquote open office hours where they'll just open up a zoom room and tell their entire staff anybody can join come and go we, we're not necessarily going to be talking about a specific topic we're just going to be working but we're it's kind of like the notion of working alongside each other so i think mm -hmm. I, you know it's definitely an interesting um idea for sure um next we're going to talk about uh, real-time collaboration tools um 97 percent of office workers obviously agree that teamwork um is crucial um i think that 
you know, obviously one plus one equals three has been a formula that the most successful companies in the world have adopted. And when you're not seeing people each day, I think the notion of teamwork becomes so much harder to execute. Uh, nearly half still find it difficult to collaborate with their team members while working remotely. And again, that collaboration really is driven by serendipity, but it's also just um, driven by just, I think, a framework of how you interact with your coworkers. And I think a new frame framework has been slowly beginning to develop in this work from home environment. But in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, people don't know how to talk or work with each other. And almost mm -hmm. like a new work working operating system has to be developed. We at Suzy uh, created what we call the work from home operating system um, that our operations and HR team put together that really directed our employees um, about how to you know, drive expectations with their coworkers. When should you be available? When is it okay to shut off? What does it mean to take off a day of work when you're really just home, but you don't want to actually work that day? Uh, and how do you communicate that with people? So I think there's so many new norms that really have to be developed in terms of what's expected of your coworkers. Yeah, I think in some ways, well, there was issues with collaboration before the crisis and, uh, uh, people weren't communicating, weren't collaborating. And I think what's happening is, this, again, this accelerated change where we see these new ideas being developed, not only for our online collaboration, but probably the future collaboration. Here's, um, and it can be, you know, this, these collaboration tools can be applied uh, in many different areas, including designing a store. This is uh, uh, an illustration of the Adidas team designing a store together um, where they, um, you know, use uh, a Verve, HTC Verve tools to um, basically develop the, the, the store, show how it's going to work in 3D, uh, and then even present to their seniors as well. Um, so we can see all different types of uh, uh, work being, um, you know, tools being developed for different types of work and different types of tasks. Absolutely. Um Nearly 40% of work from homers find it difficult to collaborate with executives while working remotely. This notion of collaborating with executives is something I'm fascinated with as well. You know, I've heard from so many friends and colleagues, we're moving out of the city. We're just going to work remotely. Um, we don't need to go into the office. I think for the young worker that really wants to move up the corporate ladder, they're going to want to be close to where the executives and the CEO and decision makers are. And if you are a new employee and you've never met any of the executives, I do believe it becomes much harder for you to be able to uh, rapidly um, expand your remit at an organization and accelerate up the corporate ladder. And I think ultimately, if the executives continue to migrate back towards the original office, I think you're quickly going to find a lot of the younger um, workers in the organization follow suit. I don't know if you had thoughts on that, but I, I think that you're disadvantaged if you're not at headquarters. It happens today. Well, yeah, I kind of, you know, uh, being present is kind of one of the mo most uh, difficult things right. to do today, you know, and uh, being seen, you know, the boss notices the the a team member who turns up early, you know. Uh, That's right. That's right. Everything, you know. Totally. Um, you know, in the, you know, work from homers might lose on a promotions, you know, 50%. This is a study that happened long before the crisis, but 50% of telecommuters don't get promoted. Now, I don't think it's true across all uh, you know, categories of workers. I think if you're in sales, for example, and you're killing your quota every single quarter, then you're going to get promoted regardless because really that's all that matters. But I think when it's much more, um, you know, qualitative versus quantitative in terms of uh, figuring out somebody's performance, that's when I think, you know, I think the, the telecommuters or people who aren't around the decision makers might be somewhat disadvantaged. So, you know, how can technology bridge the collaboration gap? Um, you know, obviously, IT decision makers really right now are focused so much on um, digital transformation versus digital reinvention, meaning, um, you know, maybe before the crisis, a lot of companies were trying to, um, you know, innovate and reinvent their business to what's next. But I think now you're finding a lot of IT decision makers really looking to just transform the way they currently do business to a more digitally based system, uh, you know, really out of necessity. And that's why you're having all these IT decision makers turning on new technologies to help with collaboration uh, within the office. Um, and when we ask what you're looking for, when looking at new technology across IT decision makers, it's really functionality that was most important when looking for new tools. Is this functional? Is it going to be rapidly um, 
you know, adopt it with it within my employee base? And is it going to help them do their jobs the most? You know, we often see so many new technology tools that are being presented to us at Suzy to allow us to be more effective in working from home. But when we look at the functionality, we often pass on it because we don't think it'll actually deliver upon that. Um, and I think s simplicity is one uh, aspect of, uh, um, you know, these type of tools that is incredibly important. If it's too complicated, it doesn't get adopted and then the, it really doesn't help with the task at hand. That's a really good stat. I love, you know, I love how kind of IT decision makers are looking for good enough tools that actually help, help the workers rather than having to push through a kind of strategic process to identify the tools these days. It's kind of rapid and scrappy a little bit, but it's uh, making sure they can, people can get to work and work as efficiently as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting with like Zoom because I think there's another misconception about technology that the best tool always wins. And there were a lot of tools before Zoom that really enabled, you know, what Zoom does. Why did Zoom take off? Because it was frictionless, it was easy and simple, and it got, you know, readily adopted. Um, and, it, you know, I think a lot of times when people develop technology products, they kind of get in their own way by making it far too um, com complex. And if it doesn't get adopted, it doesn't matter how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. As, as we bring on new clients, we have to begin to ask them what video conferencing software can they use? Uh, right. You know, different ones can use different things. Some companies can't use Google Hangouts because their browser doesn't work or uh, and Zoom yeah. has some apparent um, or, um, uh, you know, some security issues uh, or that's what's being reported. Yeah. So um, some companies can't use that. So. Uh, it's kind of interesting to kind of see the friction that's still within that system. Yeah. Um, I mean, talking about friction, they talk, you know, um, one of the other kind of themes that's going on is um, how can these systems that are being put together help the workers kind of get their jobs done, help their help those workers kind of deliver processes. So giving them the right information at the right time to help them either deal with the customer, deliver a project, develop a new product. Um, I think this is a really interesting kind of part, part of the, um, the, the, the whole kind of workspace um, trends is, you know, how are, how's technology allowing humans to actually deliver better? Yep. And, and a big part of our, I was also where, you know, we heard from, you know, the millennials saying uh, they feel they can work anywhere as long as they have their laptop. So there's the, the, the younger employee base we find is far more flexible in terms of location. Uh, obviously, you know, the younger you are, you're less likely you are to have children. So I think with the, with the younger employee base, you know, we see that happen in our company, especially this summer, people want to work from everywhere. They want to try to use this as an opportunity to travel and work from places that they would never be able to travel before. So I think when companies look at their employee base, you know, they're going to have different demands and expectations of employees based upon where they are in their lives. Um, and for some, especially younger employees, they really want the ability to be able to work from anywhere. Um, three quarters of people um, have the same access to comfort information as they did before they started working from home. And this really shows um, how adaptable the IT departments of organizations have quickly become to quickly allow information accessibility for their employee base. I mean, if you think about it, before the days of Dropbox, um, you know, information was not really readily accessible in the cloud. If you weren't in the office, you wouldn't be able to get any of the documents you needed to be able to even access your email or, um, you know, key information. And now um, everything is is really in the cloud. People can access anything anywhere. And again, this is only accelerating that trend. Um, IT decision makers largely use the same tools to enable their company to access documents from home. So you're looking at Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Dropbox. Um, these are the tools that companies are enabling for employees to be able to access um, their information uh, in a remote environment in the cloud. It was shocking to me that only 21% of employees are actually using a VPN because I think uh, you know security, um, information security is so incredibly important. We saw even before the crisis so much um, you know so much breaches, data breaches that were happening at companies and now people are working from home. One thing I thought of is what if you have one, uh, a spouse that works for Google and their other spouse works for Microsoft? Like how can they actually live together and not look at each other's laptop or at least hear what each other are talking about? So that's something in terms of a security concern that's almost impossible to get around in a remote environment. 
Um, so, you know, work from home is obviously nothing like the office. Mm -hmm. uh, Piers, I'd love to hear. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. Those, yeah. those different logos you put up just a second ago, ultimately, they're still libraries of data, or archives of data, of information. Um, and I think one of the great opportunities we see here is kind of the use of AI to um, to to go and find the right information um, to support the to support the um, the worker. So here, this example we have here, this is a chat from uh, USA Mortgage. So the kind of loan officers who are trying to um, process loans, process um, customer inquiries, inquiries. They basically um, are using a chat function, whether it's a chat in Slack, a chat in Skype, where they chat an AI to find information so they can respond. They can look up a customer's record. They can look up um, other sort of kind of factors. And then they're not only trying to service the customer faster, but they're also trying to get the, um, they're trying to use the back office less and just kind of be, be able to deal with their job faster and deliver better. Yeah, it's really sort of the democratization of decision making, right? And it, 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 I think that's so much, that's so needed in a remote environment for individuals of various levels to really have the ability and autonomy to make decisions where maybe it was slightly more bureaucratic in the past, because there's just the, the more red tape in a remote environment, it could really slow down an organization when you can't knock on your supervisor's office door and ask them, you know, for approval or something. So I think companies are going to do this out of choice. Um, you know, obviously, simplicity is everything. Uh, nearly a quarter or over a quarter of uh, uh, workers are saying that they're overwhelmed by the amount of information stored in different digital locations. So, you know, you have some stuff in Google Drive, you have some stuff in Dropbox, some stuff, um, you know, on a company's intranet system or whatever it may be. And I think one thing in this remote environment when you're when you're working remotely is where is everything? Where's everything stored? And how can you set up a system that's easy and accessible? Um, another really key point putting moving on past the actual tools and functionality is just culture. Mm -hmm. And culture is so incredibly important. Um, I'm in the middle of reading a book by Ben Horowitz of Andreessen Horowitz called it's called What You Do Is Who You Are. And it really talks about culture. And, you know, I think before this book, my perception of what culture meant is how people treat each other in an organization. And it was largely limited to just um, how you feel about your work environment. But I think culture in reading this book really has brought, it's brought my horizons of the definition of that. Um, because culture really is everything from not just the people you hire and how they interact with each other, but the products that you put out, how you deal with customers, it really touches everything. And I think largely culture needs to be redefined completely in this remote environment. And, you know, so we tried to dig in deeper in terms of what does that mean? What does a remote office culture really mean? Um, over a third of people find it difficult to have personal communications with coworkers remotely. I think, I, you know, I totally empathize with that. I think whether it's onboarding new executives, which we've done plenty of um, in Su with Susie over the last four to five months, bring on senior executives that you've never met before is very nerve wracking uh, because you don't have that trust, uh, the same level of trust as you do with people who you've worked with for a very long period of time. And to, to put so much responsibility on people you've never met, uh, you really need to over index in terms of how you onboard them and the amount of times that you communicate with them. I don't know, Piers, if you've had experience with that in terms of bringing on new employees during uh, this crisis. Well, you, for us personally, you know, we have a uh, issue where we're in between offices right now. Uh, wait, waiting for the car. Wait, so we're, um, when we're uh, recruiting new new staff, whether that's full time or contractors, they they ask the question like, "Where's your office?" And um, we don't really have an answer right now as we just try to work out how the dust is going to settle. Um, but um, it's it's obviously important that people get an idea that there will be a place to intersect. There'll be a place of shared experience. And conversation, and that's where a lot of that um, culture gets generated, uh, is from that connection from one another. And right now, working from home, you're not really a hub of communication. You're like the end end point of communication. So, um, uh, you know, we see that a lot. We, so we we try to think about how we overcome come some of that some of those issues. Absolutely.
Uh, I thought this quote was really interesting from Nicholas Bloom from Stanford saying, employees should have the following video conferences every single day. A half hour group chat to talk about anything and everything except work and 10 minute chats between bosses and direct reports. And I think it's interesting. I mean, some employees just don't want to have that half hour group chat to talk about things besides work. It's just for them, some, they feel that Zoom is exhausting and for them to have to do another half hour chat just to kind of chit chat about stuff it is an energy drain. While for other people, they find that that's where they get their energy. So I think it's really hard to, I think, uh, paint a monolithic brush across employees in terms of what they need, but it's certainly something to consider in terms of how do you actually put things on the calendar so employees can feel like there's some level of social interaction that isn't just predicated on the matter at hand. Um, but obviously so far, nothing's been able to mimic the office culture and the office environment, but there's no shortage of companies and technologies uh, looking to figure it out. Um, and you know, some people, even when in terms of like mimicking the office environment, look at work from home differently in terms of everything from the hours they work. So for example, uh, if you ask the younger generations, they'll tell you that they're gonna prefer to work an earlier workday. They wanna start out very early and end at 3 p.m. so they can start to do what they wanna um, do on a personal or leisure level, where older generations actually prefer more of a traditional workday. So already you're starting to see um, some new, um, you know, preferences come out with some employees that want to just shift the hours in which they work. Uh, if they don't need to commute into the office, then they no longer need to work, wake up at 5 a.m. If they want to be in the office by seven, they can just roll out of bed and start working at seven. And then they can end at three and have more time to do what they want to do. Um, it'll be interesting to see if some of those things actually stick. Uh, nearly a quarter of work from homers are interested in equipment that would mimic seeing their coworkers in the office. So uh, peers like the technology you spoke of earlier, mm -hmm. whether it's a window that you can look to employees um, you know, I think, you know, employees want to feel like they're not alone and they're not working in a silo that there's at least somebody uh, next to them. Yeah. It, one, of, one of the things I'm thinking about as you talk is uh, one of the challenges with work from home is um, work in some ways gets regimented. Um, there's a lot of task based work as we try to get our heads around this. And I think one of the themes that we see, one of the pushbacks is. Uh, from an organizational point of view is how do you remove the boss from the, the hub and actually let the, the um, employees talk to one another and communicate and work with one another rather than the, everybody always turning to the boss as part of that feedback loop. Why do you, why do you think that's important? <laughs> why do I think it's important? Yeah. You know, yeah, because I think, you know, um, ultimately there's only like, one employ one boss to every 10 20 employees so right. um you know how it slows everything down doesn't it you know right. and, yeah. and it, everyone wants a fulfilled job i think you know we have to trust and when talking about trust systems this is a this is a screen grab from a company called bonusly which allows employees to reward each other um actually you know bosses don't often see a lot of the work that gets done uh, the, the kind of like um, treading of water and the, um, that's happening uh, whilst uh, the, the ship is being sailed. And so we see a lot of, um, uh, we see employees here uh, give points to one another for work that hasn't been recognized. And what happens oh, wow. at the end of a period, could be a year, could be a month, um, you know, um, the, the system will then uh, monetarily reward uh, the employee are providing some other types of rewards and obviously give visibility to the management as well. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I think the recognition and just to your point, you know, it's much harder to gain recognition when you're out of, out of sight. So, yeah. you know, what are the little things that people are doing the critical inches on business that aren't being recognized? And for, I think, you know, other employees to recognize one another is a great way. And it's very cool. It's something we should check out. Um, over a quarter of work from homers are interested in a company facilitating post work social activities with their coworkers. At Suzy, we've done a ton. We've tried many different things, whether it be uh, virtual yoga. We did a virtual movie screening the other night where everyone watched a movie together remotely. Um, we've done, um, we hired a, a personal trainer to do um, group classes. I think that would, at the very beginning of the crisis, you saw Verizon hire a famous DJ for their employees. It seems that now many companies aren't doing as much anymore because at first they were pushing and now they're kind of used to working remote. But I think it's important that companies don't take for granted that they need to keep their employees engaged. And these things are still incredibly important. Sure. 
Um, another thing I'll say, it's interesting. So we did a, uh, so we do weekly all staffs and we tried to do these sort of random breakout groups because we have 80 people at the company and we did 10 breakout groups of eight people each to have um, a smaller discussion. And on Zoom, at least, you can do these breakout rooms where it'll pull at random different groups of eight people together, however many you want in each breakout room, to talk with one another. And all of a sudden, I found myself in a room with seven other employees, five of which who have never actually met in person. And ironically, the discussion was about what we should do about our office. And it was one thing that popped out across all the mini discussions we had is that everyone really misses the office environment and many asked that we at least create before it was safe to have one big office, just smaller offices. So if people lived in New Jersey, we'd create an office for the 15 people that live in New Jersey, which they can go to because it's just, there'll still be social distancing, but it's a smaller amount of people and they wouldn't have to deal with commuting. So I think it'll be interesting to see how all this slowly ramps back up um, where many companies will either obviously take a phased approach with their existing office, or if they can maybe create new office structures where people can still kind of get together, but in a little bit of a safer format. And I think commuting seems to be a really big concern of many people, especially with those who work in cities. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the sort of we work type spaces where, um, so maybe instead of having an office 100% of the time, you have an office 20% of the time and you'll get to meet each other occasionally but that's all you need absolutely yeah i mean and yet, mm -hmm. sorry go on no no i mean you know i was just gonna say you know one of the other things that we just need to think about is kind of the home office perk and you were just talking about some of the things like the djs and things like that but at the same time you know we in our offices we had snacks and kitchens full of cereals and um ping pong tables and where have they all gone? And how do you kind of like provide this extra features um, to the uh, to the worker? And so um, this, this this is an important theme to address when it thinks about you think about the workspace. Absolutely. Yeah. As as I said, where have all those uh, benefits gone? Yeah. So um, benefits are so is something that. I think many companies have to figure out how to do remotely. Uh, over 60% of people currently prefer their work setup versus their home setup. So one big benefit that and shouldn't even really be looked at as a benefit that companies need to think about providing is equipment. Um, you know, whether it's working on two monitors, which I've found to be, you know, almost a mandate during this. It's so hard to work on one monitor when you're on Zoom and you have, you're trying to get emails done, et cetera. But it, it's equipment. It's the right space. You know, we've had some employees that have to work out of closets because they're a significant other. Is, they live in a studio and the significant others in the main room and they're in the closet or the hallway. And, uh, you know, so what we're trying to do is figure out, okay, well, what does it mean if we provide you with extra space that you can go work out a couple of days a week? Uh, or how do we give you the right equipment so you can be uh, that much more um, impactful um, in your in your environment? Exactly. Well, this is a screenshot from Reddit, but um, the reason it's there is because Reddit have been very active in terms of how they can support their their workers. Um, they have uh, various stipends to that they hand out. So obviously they, uh, like probably many of the people on the call, their organizations begin to pay for internet use and things like that. But they're also, they used to have travel stipends and other kind of uh, travel budgets, and they've reallocated that and so that um, staff can get a certain budget to kind of uh, make up their house better, their home office better, better lighting, better video camera, better white walls and stuff like that. So, uh, That's good. Yeah. for sure. Um, you know, we've been asked a lot, well, people working from home, what are they purchasing? Um, some employees obviously have to purchase on their own while other companies uh, reimburse, but the computer products that bought, it's been largely obviously Microsoft and Apple products. Uh, many times that's driven by the, the operating systems that the companies are on. Some companies are Windows based organizations, others are Mac um, and companies obviously in, in other instances are providing stipends to your point for employees to be able to purchase this equipment. Um, one third of uh, you know of American workers and work from home are still saying that that they would leave their current employer to pursue more attractive benefits and perks elsewhere. And this is important because just because we're in a remote environment doesn't mean it doesn't matter anymore. So I think those perks uh, do matter. I th I think it's a double edged sword because I think with a lot of these work from home perks, uh, sometimes they just come off as a little bit kitschy. 
and not really impactful. Ultimately, the best work from home, um, you know, uh, perk that I think a lot of parents could use is childcare. But how many companies are really providing childcare, for example? Because how can you, especially you look at coming back in the fall, I think obviously the number one question I believe in September in culture and society in America is what's going to happen with school? Um, you know, if, if school is not back on and it's remote in a lot of the large U.S. cities and suburbs, well, then many, I, I believe, you know, families will who live in cities or near cities will start to move further away from cities. Um, and I think that's going to have a massive impact on real estate, on office space, on retail, et cetera. And then in that world, what's how are they? If they still have to work, but their kids are working from home, how and the fall gets so busy, what does that look like? Um, you know, and so that's once. I guess the middle would be a hybrid. We're hearing from a lot of people who have children in school, at least in the New York City area, where you know they're saying that you know be like two days on, two days off. Uh, but then, how does that really work? Because you'd have to align your work schedule, or will school say, you know what, we're going full back on? But I think as schools go in America in September is as culture and the workforce is going to go. It's just a huge driver. Uh, and I'm just really curious to see how that mm -hmm. all unfolds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so those are the eight topics uh, we covered today uh, that we covered in the report rather five, of which we covered today from video, the virtual real time collaboration tools, assistant workforce, remote work culture and home office perks. And again, uh, we'll be emailing to everybody um, after the call today, um, th a report that covers three additional topics that we didn't cover in the webinar, micro upskilling, the notion of new hiring and onboarding and a mental health focus, which has been, I don't know for you peers, but we've been really focused on just trying to support the mental health of our employees through all of this, where it's just incredibly hard to automatically be pulled out of your environment the way that so many people have. And I think it's come with a lot of uh, mental health issues really for employees of all ages. Sure, sure, definitely of all ages. I mean, you know, sometimes we always think the younger people are uh, more resilient, but they're, they're the ones who are stuck by themselves in apartments and things like that. So um, I think we, uh, the companies, you know, companies need to think holistically about uh, what solutions they can provide their workers. And I, I really enjoyed this presentation and the research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. it's going to help everybody, whether you're in the business of um, of, of um, using this research or you're just an employer or employee. So, um, really yeah, useful. and we've got we had some questions that are coming from the audience, Pierce, so maybe we'll go through them. Uh, the first of which is, have you seen the relationships between coworkers get better or worse over the past three months? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Um, have relationships. Well, I, I, as I said, I think, you know, the, there's the challenges is, um, most workers are at the end of the kind of heart, you know, nose at the end of these spokes rather than, you know, they're in more of a dynamic situation. I think everybody kind of reports into boss and they kind of talk to each other. I think we need to overcome that. I, I don't know. I don't have the data to kind of prove that. Right. Right. And I think it's really hard anecdotally to know. I mean, I think that's, that's one thing that, it's how do you know how people feel about one another? We've instituted a tool at Suzy called Peacon, P-E-A-K-O-N, which basically every week anonymously polls every single employee and basically ask them everything you're thinking and feeling. And it's really uncovered so much because unless you ask, you really never know. Um, all your employees may hate their coworkers um, or they may love them and, and, and they're probably not going to tell you um, in normal course of business. So um, I would imagine that that's kind of all, all across the board in terms of how. I, also, I also think one of the things to think about is uh, right now, as we kind of don't hire, we're beginning to hire freelancers and other staff. And how do you, how do you embrace those contractors so that they have some sort of sense of the culture as well? And so yeah. I think that's important as well. Yeah. So here's a question from Tina. She said, my husband has always been a 100% remote employee. His firm, a large corporation, has not encouraged face-to-face -face video interaction due to exploding bandwidth during the day. What recommendation would you give for this? I feel that uh, coworkers and um, the relationships would be better, especially that you've never met face-to-face -face would be so much more solid. I mean, I agree. I think I think face-to-face -face interactions is incredibly important. I think that to have a company that just does phone-based conversations, I mean, I've been asked to give webinars and one of the large financial institutions that asked me to give one said, we don't we don't uh, have the ability to give video-based presentations. It's just gonna have to be a call. And I basically gave a, a conference call to 250 bankers when I couldn't see them. And I can tell you that 
I had no idea how engaged they were. And I think that it was really hard without visual aid to really be able to connect with the audience as a presenter. Mm -hmm. So I think that companies need to figure out ways and it doesn't need to be every single call needs to be um, video based, but I do think it's an important part of the overall mix. Yeah, I think, uh, go ahead. Go on, please, no, please go. No, I just, I just think, um, you know, we, we already mentioned earlier that what is the, when do you take an audio call and when do you take a video call? I think that has to be decided or those rules have to be developed. Absolutely. Yep, there has to be some type of protocol. Uh, Christina asked this question, any info on monitoring employee productivity in a work from home mode? So I believe that employee productivity should be monitored, but I believe it should be done in a transparent way. Uh, I saw a story, I believe in the New York Times, um, a couple months ago that some large corporations were essentially spying on employees to gauge their productivity, you know, and just seeing what they were doing by either looking at their communications, et cetera. And I just think you talked about trust and that's kind of pulling trust completely out of the equation. I think that if you're going to be monitoring productivity, the employees should know um, how they're being monitored and what success looks like. And I think for obviously some functions like sales, it's easy, easiest to know what they're, Productivity is because how much stuff did they sell, right? But I think for other types of employees, whether you're an engineer or maybe you're an account manager, maybe measuring their productivity is a little bit more complex. There's no shortage of tools out there that allow you to monitor productivity. But again, I think it's important that the employees just know how they're being monitored, make sure they're okay with it and what the, you know, what the parameters of those expectations are. It's probably important to also kind of just be careful of the productivity trap where just because you're putting the hours in doesn't mean you're actually doing any better. Or totally. Anything. Yeah. Well, I actually don't think productivity means time worked at all. I think it, it's really about the output. And I think that's the beauty of the work from home environment. I mean, some employees would go into an office when there were offices and they would screw around for half the day. And even if they were the first in and last, last out, they weren't really doing much. And others go in and get their work done and leave. So getting their first or leaving last doesn't necessarily mean you're the most productive. And I think the work from home environment really allows those who are truly productive to really be able to shine because they can kind of get what they need to get done on their own terms. Um, this question from Jen, how do you think you can help with integrating new employees who started since the crisis occurred? I think that's, I don't know if you had any thoughts on uh, onboarding. I mean, it's been something that we've been incredibly focused on at Suzy. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear more. Yeah. So I mean, for, I mean, so we've hired in the last month, we've hired five new vice presidents at our company, um, three of which that have already started. And, you know, it's a nerve wracking experience because again, the, it's so hard to just trust people that you've never met in person before. And we hired wonderful people that, um, you know, there's every reason to trust, but it's just how, if you've never met them, you know, you feel like you don't know them as well. And for me, at least, I've really made an intentional effort to get to know them and schedule as many calls as I can um, with these um, new hires and as well as facilitate calls with them and just many people throughout the organization. So a big part of it is just facilitating as much communication as possible, um, you know, really being intentional about having them uh, touch multiple facets of the organization so they can truly understand what we're trying to accomplish at our company. And then making sure that they have what they need to be able to uh, effectively get ramped up because uh, we think we know what they need, whether it's information or tools, but there could be so much more that they need in terms of collaboration to really feel like they finally are in a position to be able to deliver upon their jobs. So yeah. I, I, I think it's something that companies really need to triple down on now if they really want their new hires to be incredibly successful. Yeah, it just reminds me of like how can, you know, it's still a lot of the, companies are just giving libraries of content and expecting the employees to kind of read the handbook. And I think, you know, we saw those examples of tools, AI tools that could be used to help employees get to decisions faster. And it'd be great to kind of explore those and invest in those better. Absolutely. Here's a question um, from some of these initials is NM and it's how do you get people to actually regularly compete the pecan quiz? We have a similar tool, but have uh, trouble actually getting employees to use it. You know, this tool that we have, and, and I can't take credit for it, our chief people officer, Anthony Anesto, has deployed it. 
it really just is very short form. So much like the way that we at Suzy believe market research should be, uh, this is heavily uh, geared towards short form, uh, fill in one sentence, answer one question. We're not asking people to fill out surveys because I think filling out surveys is something that nobody wants to do, especially at the end of a long work day. So just make it easy for people to give feedback. And it's within those little tidbits of information that you really get all you need to be able to sort of course correct it and pivot for sure. Um, Christina P asked, are companies overestimating their role in creating a social environment for employees? My feeling is that without office camaraderie, people will adjust on their own. They'll start building strong relationships with people that aren't place-based. Uh, and that may or not include people they work with. So that's really interesting. I mean, so Christina brings up a point, doesn't really matter. Do people really need relationships with people that they work with? Or is just kind of that happening by happenstance in the past? What do you what do you think about that, Pierce? It's, like, it's a great question. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, I started thinking about like, you know, what is the role of the corporation? What is the role of the brand? Um, for so too, too often, brands think that they need to create communities and they need to be involved in their customers. And I think there's a point, there's a point, there's a point where you can be, basically be a platform to these things. Um, but does the brand always have to show up? You know, can the brand enable things or the core the company enable things, but does the boss have to show up? Does the company really have to show up or can it just fund some of these um, activities that allow, kind of allow your employees to connect? I still think it's important that uh, employees have a sense, sense of work and value and kind of feel that they're creating value through their work. I think, especially with younger employees, my experience has been that their work community and their work friendships are a huge part of their lives. And it's one way that people can create deep and meaningful friendships later on in life, uh, where it, the older you get, it, it can be harder to develop meaningful relationships. And the amount of families and babies that have been born out of office relationships, for better or for worse, um, is significant. I think the amount of best friends and close personal relationships mm -hmm. and experiences that have been created by people who work together is significant. And those relationships don't only help you while you're working with somebody, but these are relationships that you're going to have throughout the rest of your career. I mean, there are former employees of mine that are now clients. Um, there's former employees of mine that are really close friends and, and advocates and people who I lean into on a personal and business level. And I think without those, I would not have as full of a life. So I think, I do think it's important. And I do think that p people really lean into that. And I actually think it's going to be a benefit and sort of like a, a competitive differentiation for companies that do have offices. I think if I'm a young person coming out of university and I come to a big city, I probably will want to work for a company that has an office versus one that doesn't because I'm going to be able to meet my, my, my future best friend or my future yeah. spouse or create it's relationships. I think that's incredibly important. Yeah, it's an interesting point. This, you know, um, my kids have just finished binge watching The Office, which is a kind yeah. of a little cheesy, but it's a reflection on, on office work and, um, I Jim and Pam have happened, right? Without, the without, but they talk yeah. about how you find the best, you know, work is where your best friends are. Um, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting line for sure. And, uh, well, if you think about it in the office, you have people from all different ethnicities. I also think it's like a more of a melting pot of people of different ages, mm -hmm. ethnicities, et cetera. Many people grow up and they just become friends with the people around them. And then when you go to college, you become friends with the people who go to their same college, which often means they're of the same socioeconomic level or at least interest level of you. Then you get thrown into an office level and you're with people of all different ages that are from all different places, all different mm -hmm. ethnicities. And you become friends with people that maybe you wouldn't ever have become friends with. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's, that's a part of, in my opinion, growing up and, and, and creating work relationships. So I think it's important, but I understand that it's not necessarily the role of a company, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, Rebecca asked a question, speak to the training and mentoring the entry level people. I mean, listen, I think that's incredibly important. We're, we're trying to do things at Suzy where, um, you know, we're connecting the entry level people with, um, people, um, that have a little bit more seniority in an organization so they can almost have like a big brother, little brother type of interaction to continue to just show people the ropes. I think, um, if you're an entry level employee coming out of college and coming to a company where you've never worked at a company before. You have no idea what it's ever been like to work in an office. So I think that's not an easy thing for both the employer or the employee to be able to understand. So again, there's so yeah. many unknowns within all this in terms of- I think, uh, I, think, I think in your report, the report we put it together, there's a section, a whole big section about all the different themes around kind of iterating and skilling, micro-skilling. 
to allow kind of employees to onboard and kind of uh, improve and become productive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing's for sure that coming out of this, many companies will never be the same. Many companies will not open an office again. Others will at Suzy, we will be opening an office again, but we'll be looking at the office environment differently. I mean, I think the way the office has traditionally been structured is there's a bunch of desks where people go to and they basically do their emails next to people during a day. And I think when you're doing that, you necessarily don't need to be in an office, but when you're collaborating, whether you're sitting in a lounge type environment and meeting with other people or you're in a conference room, that's when you do need to be in an office. So we're, we're planning on building our new office uh, much more around collaboration and less about just the individual work that needs to get done. You can stay home for that if you want. But if you're in the office and you want to collaborate, we're going to have the best collaboration environment that exists. So you can really have those serendipitous moments and great conversations and, you know, in-depth meetings to allow us to really continue to grow as a business. But I think every company is going to have to decide what, you know, is best for them moving forward. Matt, so I feel you're going to get as many r resumes yeah. than, than you are got researching queries yeah. based on this conversation. Sounds like a great thing to work. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying that, Piers. And thanks again for all the help that you and the PSFK um, have given us um, with the study. It's really been great partnering with you guys, and we really look forward to future collaborations. I've long personally been an admirer of you and your organization, so it's just been a real thrill for us to be able to partner with you guys on this. Appreciate it, Matt. Uh, it's a great report. I hope everybody uh, downloads it and checks it out. Okay, great. Well, that's all we have for today on the future of work. Uh, on behalf of my co-presenter, Pierce Fox, and myself, uh, Matt Britton, I just want to thank you guys all for joining. I hope you guys really all have a great week and stay safe out there. And until next time.